first of all, it's great to be at Cotty's with Linda Carroll. It's been a long time and uh, brings back a lot of memories because her brother, Billy, was one of my favorite people in the whole world. I never had more fun, or probably never got in as much trouble as I did with Billy, but it was, it was a great growing up experience. And it was because of Billy that I knew Charlie. Um, Charlie was a little bit like the Pied Piper. Look, I gotta talk to you, baby. You're terrific. You know what you are? Just an average, ordinary tuna. Our uh, average, ordinary tuna, honey, you're star-kissed quality. Star-kissed all the way. And I'll tell you something else. There's a star-kissed tuna scout in the neighborhood. Ooh, gee. Do you think he'd ever notice me? Uh, confidentially, honey, I can arrange it. You just, you know, swim along with me. Mother always said I was the star-kissed type. But I never dream. Yeah, sure, sure. Just let's us take a little turn along the coral. Look! Hey. Sorry, Charlie. <laughs> sit there on the front step at Murray Place, but we'd wait for Charlie to come home and kind of open up. And he would open up, and we'd all go upstairs to the top floor, and you would see the most spectacular stereo system that anybody ever saw. He had this amazing stereo system, and we all used to hang up there and listen to the best music in the 60s, Jefferson Airplane, Stones, Beatles, you name it, The Doors. And he was meticulous with his albums. No one could touch his albums. And he would, he was like the DJ. And he would introduce us to all these great albums of which Love Forever Changes came out, I believe, in 1967. He gave this to me, and I, of course I still have it. To Linda from Charlie. There's a paper sleeve inside that the record is in. So when you pull it out, it should be open at the top. I'm gonna use these two fingers and my thumb these two fingers will go on the uh, label and the thumb is caressing the side of the record and you just slide it out and you're going to put it on the turntable and you have to clean it and they have cleaning kits and Charlie told me all about this he said you have to have a cleaning kit to get dirt and residue off your record before you play it and it comes with you put three drops of this cleaning solution and this is a lint brush disc washer, it's called. And it's got this little hole there I forgot about. That's where you put the, the cleaner. So you open, shake it, and you're gonna put three drops. In a line on one side, and that's the side you're gonna put on the record first. By having this come in contact with it, on that side and after the record goes around two revolutions it should be clean okay again this this is cute it goes right in there and it goes like that to get the needle on the first track what is happening and how have you been words about our old friend Chaz. Uh, professionally, what first comes to mind is his loyalty and his dedication. Uh, when he was due, when he was in, he was on the job 10 minutes early and ready to fly. Um, one, one of the things that come to my mind is uh, the way he was able to uh, handle our reservations and maximize our seating ability and uh, controlling the flow. and. Uh, Making the, making the night as smooth as could be. And Charlie had this wonderful heart. He just opened his life to us, and he sort of provided you know, a place for us to be when we were sort of 15, 16, 17 years old, and nobody ever forgot it.
we always tried to circle back to Charlie, regardless of you know where we were, or how far we were away. We would go and see him, you know, when he started to work at the Alchemist. Chaz was an avid Yankee fan, and uh, we used to debate who was better, the Mick, the Say Kid, or the Duke. And uh, being he was such a big Yankee fan and a Mickey Mantle fan, we'd always end up leaning toward being it being the Mick. And wherever you are now, Chaz, I hope you have a good view of the game, uh, be it the Yankees or the Orioles. When I was playing in the band, the Ivy Men, um, we were playing at, um, we were supposed to play at the Cannon Club at Princeton University. And I had told Billy that if he comes early, he probably could get in and there would be plenty of beer. And, you know, but we were going to start to play at 8 o'clock, so if he showed up at 6.30 or 7, you know, I'm sure he could get in. He could say he was with the band. So Billy showed up and, and Charlie came with him. And I can't remember, but I think John Panzer might have been there too. And um, Charlie commented that he couldn't understand why they were building us a stage in the basement of Cannon Club to play on. And, you know, the Cannon brothers would walk by and say, oh yeah, it's on the stage. The stage was only four inches high, nobody could figure it out. Charlie was the one that came to the brilliant conclusion that if they hadn't built the four-inch stage about two o'clock in the morning, we all would have been electrocuted by two inches of beer on the floor at Cannon Club. I know Charlie from working on Nassau Street back in the 70s. He was somebody I saw every morning. Hi, Charlie. Rest in peace. I got you. <laughs>